I actually discovered the story of Oram Ardiganian, I would say, rather late, I mean, about 15 years ago. And it first occurred as a sort of an accident. I was at um, the Genocide Museum in Yerevan, and I just purchased that DVD of Ravished Armenia, so the film that was made in 1919 based on the true story of genocide survivor Aurora Mardiganyan. But at that time, I didn't know how important she was in the history of cinema and in the history of genocide. Aurora Mardiganyan is, for me, an extraordinary figure. What is extraordinary about her is that she's not just, of course I have to be careful here, a survivor of the genocide and a witness of the genocide, but she was also an activist and the first person in the history of genocide and in the history of cinema who actually played her own role in a Hollywood production. But we have to imagine her in that time, so 100 years ago, in a time where not only the concept of genocide was not yet established, in a time where traumatic experiences were also not acknowledged, in a time where the, the, the notion of surviving was also not fully acknowledged, in a time also where uh, working with survivors in that particular context was also a totally new terrain. So she survived all of this, and she was also, almost by accident, becoming that super celebrity, that actress that she probably never had dreamed of, as Atome Goyan phrased himself. It's an uneasy marriage of glamour and atrocity. Indeed, the combination of being such a celebrity, she was really a star, short-lived, but she was a star in early American cinema. And at the same time, addressing, embodying even, the most inimaginable and unspeakable atrocities. She was, and here I borrow the term uh, from Atome Goyen, a super survivor. Because of course she did survive uh, at a very high price, uh, the genocidal experience itself. But she also had to survive the making of the film, the production of the film, everything that it entails. The fact that she had to survive being put so much onto the spotlight, not really understanding what is was happening to her, and at the same time fighting for telling her story, because she was, you know, very much moved by this mission of bearing witness to her people. She was indeed surviving a system that completely exported her, exploited her financially, exploited her emotionally. She also had a major breakdown very shortly after the making of the film. And even though she suffered physical injury and psychological damages by making this film, by impersonating her own person so short after the events themselves, which is today unthinkable, of course, beyond that, she was always animated and oriented by this original mission of bearing witness. How can I make people realize what my people has been through? Not just me as a young woman, but also the entire Armenian people. And in that sense, it also makes Aurora at the center of this extraordinary fact, which is that there is a very troubling analogy between the loss and the forgotten genocide and the loss and the forgotten film. This is probably one of the most symptomatic illustrations of denial. One of the reasons, of course, today it's very important to keep talking about Aurora and to, you know, find ways to address her own story is also because she was mute for so many years or forced to be mute implicitly. Of course, she was, you know, she was living with her own traumatic experience, which did not always facilitate. But yet, at the same time, she wanted to talk. As Ruben Adalian from the Zorian Institute said about Aurora when he interviewed her in the mid-80s, he said she was an amazing storyteller and that she had this drive and this vivacity to communicate about what she went through. But 
all these years she has been forgotten. And then now, since a few years, especially I would say since 2015, there was an acceleration. There was a need for more representation, for more forms of bearing witness. And then she became this iconic figure as we know her today. The mission that she actually initiated is far from being closed. And one thing we need to do today is of course to tell her story and keep searching for reconstituting the lost and the fragments of our own history, story and genealogy. But it's also about this question for the future generation. What is the best way to bear testimony? Especially in a time as today where everything is circulating so fast, where we are oversaturated with confessional videos and social media, etc. And yet, there is still this ongoing necessity, be it fragile, be it lacunary, be it sometimes not always completely appropriate, but yet there is this ongoing necessity, I think for Armenian people to tell the stories of the survivors. So maybe we cannot completely reconfigure, maybe we cannot completely reconstitute what was the story, but if there is one thing we can do, if we honor our mission, is trying as much as we can to find and to experiment the ways and the mode to pass on and to be a witness.